right. Um, so, uh, Elon Kuchi, Anish, excuse me, <laughs> Nisha Nawi Bue, interdisciplinary artist and writer hailing from Nipissing First Nation. She is a Nova Scotia College of Art and Design University alumna and received her MFA in interdisciplinary art, media, and design at Ontario College of Art and Design University, where she focused her thesis on reconciliation and its relationship to monument and public art. She's currently in her second year of, of study at Queen's University, where she's working on her PhD in the Cultural Studies program. Her written gallery and public works explore the intersections of colonial First Nations, histories of place, culture, and indigenous erasure, as well as the issues of misrepresentation and cultural appropriation. She's been the recipient of several awards, including an Outstanding Scholar Achievement in Contemporary Sculpture um, Award through the International Sculpture Center and a Premier's Award through Ontario Colleges. She serves as a chair of Native Women in the Arts and currently lives and works from her home community of Nipissing First Nation in Ontario, uh, Northern Ontario. And I want everyone um, to give a warm welcome. Um, Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen here. I, I'm gonna stop uh, sharing my video while I do the, um, while I do my talk and I'll turn it back on in time for Q&A. Hi everyone. All right. <clears throat> okay, so play the current slide. So everybody can see that okay? Yeah, you can see it okay, Sarah? Yeah, yeah, we're good. Okay, great. Okay, so I'm in Elan Kuchi Dijnikaz Nibizing Nonjaba Memishkini Donap Dodem. Hello, my name is Elan Kuchi. I'm an Ishnabe Kwe mother, grandmother, interdisciplinary artist, and writer hailing from the Red. Tailhawk clan of Nipissing First Nation, located in Northern Ontario, where I live and work. I completed my Bachelor of Fine Arts at NASCAD University in Nova Scotia and went on to OCAD University in Toronto, where I earned my Master of Fine Arts in the Interdisciplinary Art, Media, and Design program. I'm currently at the end of my second year of completing a PhD in Cultural Studies at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, where I'm working to uncover hidden histories of the Nipissing people and our Aki or land. I'm also a professor in the graduate studies program at OCAD University. So first I'd like to thank Sarah and the Texas Women's University for inviting me to share my work and knowledge. Uh, this talk comes at a time of reflection for me as we approach Canada's National Day for Truth and Reconciliation this Friday. Um, each year, September 30th marks the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. The day honors the children who never returned home and survivors of residential schools, as well as their families and communities. Uh, public commemoration of the tragic and painful history and ongoing impacts of residential schools is a vital component of the reconciliation process. Process. So I wanted to give you guys kind of just a backgrounder because part of my work is based on residential schools, um, just on what the residential school um, uh, thing was in Canada. So um, the term residential schools refers to an extensive school system set up by the Canadian government and administered by ch churches that had the nominal objective of educating um, Indigenous children but also the more damaging and equally explicit objectives of indoctrinating them into Euro-Canadian and Christian ways of living and assimilating them into mainstream white Canadian society. The residential school system officially operated from the 1880s into the closing decades of the 20th century. The last residential school in Canada closed in 1996. The system forcibly separated children from their families for extended periods of time and forbade them to acknowledge their indigenous heritage and culture or to speak their own languages. 
Children were severely punished if these, among other strict rules, were broken. Former students of residential schools have spoken of horrendous abuse at the hands of residential school staff, physical, sexual, emotional, and psychological. Residential schools systematically undermined Indigenous, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit cultures across Canada and disrupted families for generations, severing the ties through which Indigenous culture is taught and sustained and contributing to a general loss of language and culture. Because they were removed from their families, many students grew up without experiencing a nurturing family life and without the knowledge and skills to raise their own families. The devastating effects of the residential schools are far reaching and continue to have a significant impact upon Indigenous communities. The residential school system is widely considered a form of genocide because of the purposeful attempts from the government and church to eradicate all aspects of Indigenous cultures and life worlds. So my direct relationship to the reg residential school legacy is through my grandfather, Thomas Kuchi, an Anishinaabe man who attended residential school at Garnier Residential School for Boys in Spanish Ontario, a few hours away from our Nipissing community. He returned home as a changed person who was no longer able to speak Anishinaabe Moen, which is the Anishinaabe language, fluently. As a child, I heard my grandfather talk about the school he attended, and often his stories were of beatings he'd received for speaking Ojibwe, which is also called Anishinaabe, as well as one quasi-famous infamous escape attempt made with his cousin, Lawrence Commanda. 10 months and two days before the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was established, my grandfather died from an illness stemming from tuberculosis. I often wonder what he would think about the fact that his stories could be joined by thousands of others who brought their testimony to the attention of people across the country and worldwide. It became important for me to ensure my grandfather's truth and stories live on in a good way because of my love and respect for him and since he never saw the TRC resolutions come to light. Part of decolonizing includes learning about and understanding the true histories and injustices imposed upon racialized peoples through settler colonialism. This is where the basis of my written and artistic work lies. In my sculpture and installation, I employ hybridization through materials and form, which plays an important role in the meaning and intention behind each work. So for this sculpture <clears throat> titled Aggressive Assimilation, I began by researching old black and white photos of my grandfather's residential school, which is shown on the image in the right. The sculpture takes its form as a representation of the steeple, which stood atop the school's building and the formal qualities embody what went on inside. Children were locked in at night, bars on the window and, punished for, and punishment for speaking one's own language was often met with, met with lashes from a yardstick. In this work, the found objects used were vintage yardsticks, which were incorporated into the siding of this piece. And it's kind of hard to see in this picture, but um, you can see some of the some of the pieces of wood have have written up writing on them, the, the yardstick writing. So this work was created in 2013 when the Truth Reconciliation Commission of Canada was just beginning their inquiry. It was through conversations with gallery viewers about the meaning behind the work that I discovered many Canadians had no idea residential schools even existed. At this moment, I understood that my sculptural work could function in a pedagogical fashion, acting as a teaching tool for non-Indigenous Canadians to encounter hidden histories and consider its impacts upon survivors, Indigenous communities, and Native generations today. So though I uh, primarily work in sculpture and installation, as a multidisciplinary artist, I also work in printmaking, oil and film, oil painting and film. Um, this work titled Precarious Binding was created in response to the First Nation community of Grassy Narrows and their ongoing battle with toxic waters stemming from the dumping. Is everything okay? Okay. And I was can't. Okay. Um, uh, stemming from the dumping of mercury into their waterways by the Dryden paper mill. 
This not only affected the community's water supply, but poisoned the fish and wildlife the community is dependent on. Discovered in 1970, this community still has mercury poisoning running rampant in their community, which results in premature deaths to this day. Despite many promises made by the Ontario government to address this deadly situation, the community continues to petition the government in calls to action, protests, and annual awareness campaigns. So moving into kind of a different topic, um, I, be, I am part of a group, you know, a, a very large group of Indigenous women in Canada who are um, out at marches and, um, and protests with regard to the missing and murdered Indigenous women um, epidemic in Canada. So um, I created this work as part of that. Uh, for decades, Indigenous women have been gathering each February and throughout the year to call attention to Canada's disproportionately high rate ratio of missing and murdered Indigenous women, also known as MMIW. These advocates work tirelessly, raising their voices in protests, drumming and song on behalf of those who've been silenced. It beats inside for all who speak. Uh, it, it beats inside all who speak for those who can't. Remind me never to do long titles for my work again, uh, pays tribute to those impassioned and dedicated women. Stretched across this large scale hand drum, a gauze swath holds the women's warrior song within its embroidery. The song intrinsic to MMIW advocacy has been transposed to pattern and stitched into the delicate swath as a visual offering of those whose voices have gone silent. <clears throat> So for Sweat Lodge, I again hybridize materials and form to infer meaning upon my reflection of aspects of Indigenous versus Western healing. This work considers customary approaches to healing in contrast to Western-based clinical medicine. Traditionally, Sweat Lodges were and are still used by First Nations people as a form of healing, but in contrast, the majority now visit hospitals and mental health clinics. These medical facilities are typically cold concrete buildings, sterile, clean, and monotone. A sweat lodge ceremony is customarily per performed in a wooded area. A hot rock pit is dug into the ground, tree branches are used as framework, and a mixture of blankets, fur, and bark cover the structure. This work represents the decline of one form of tradition that has occurred within indigenous culture. I wanted to unite traditional and present day by building a sweat lodge using artificial materials such as acrylic rods, plaster rocks, and white taffeta. The center of the rock pit is illuminated by LED lights shone against mirrored speakers, which in turn caused the lights to move with the beats of drumming played through an iPod. The white darkness of the lodge and the artificial light from the quote unquote fire bridge the gap between clinical and traditional healing. This work won 2015's Outstanding uh, Student Achievement Award in Contemporary Sculpture through the International Sculpture Center and was exhibited at the Grounds for Sculpture in New Jersey, as well as Manic Contemporary in New Jersey and Chicago. So I'm gonna start this one with a reading um, from my writing for Arts Everywhere titled, When Textbooks Are Held yeah. Within <laughs> Oh my God. Story. Click, clank, whisk. Stones kick up off the dirt road, hitting the wheel wells and bouncing back off, back out. The smell of dust mixed with old leather seats blows through the open windows. It's a late summer morning as my grandfather's old truck pulls up to a stop at the side of the road. Grabbing the old green Coleman jug, my grandfather looks at me. Let's ne go, Nicole. He rarely called me by my first name. I still don't know why. Trudging further and further into the woods, we'd pick winter green to chew. My grandfather would stop every now and then to point um, things out to me, like sumac and the type of lichen you can boil for tea how to find food hidden in and beneath the trees, or how he could tell that a rabbit had recently passed by. 
Some of these things I had heard before, some perhaps not, but I never let him know. We finally reached our destination, a cropping of moss and rock where bub water bubbled out of the ground from deep places below. I'll never forget the wonderful taste of cold, cold water as I drank from my grandfather's cupped hands. In my mind, I don't believe I've ever tasted anything so pure since, nor do I think I ever will again. But this is what we came for, this fresh and pure spring that gurgled softly in the middle of the woods. This water, Nibi, collected and stored in that scuffed Coleman jug, used for good tea and for drinking, until it was time to collect more. Dibuewen. This is an Anishinaabe word I've seen described in different ways, but the one I like most is the way in which Anishinaabe Kwe curator and war word warrior Wanda Nanabush explains it as heart truth. For me, Dibuewen encompasses the way in which I choose to engage or not engage with the world. I try to keep in my mind that I can only speak about the world as I experience it. Well, this is true for many writers and artists, for me, it also centers my accountability back to my own family and to my community. It was with my community in mind that I created this work uh, for a semi-annual semi -out outdoor exhibition called Ice Follies, which sees artists creating work to be displayed on Lake Nipissing, the lake named after our community, the lake our community depends on. As longtime cohabitants, the residents of North Bay, which is which is uh, borders Nipissing First Nation, um, the residents of North Bay and Nipissing First Nation have had a relationship that has been contentious with respect to the health of our shared waterway, Lake Nipissing. A seemingly never-ending conflict over the declining population or pickle, pickerel, um, which is also called walleye finds many area residents and businesses blaming the Anishinaabeg for netting. At the same time, there exists an unacknowledged history of settlers who have themselves overfished these waters in the past and continue to take from Nipissing both in the summer and winter with hundreds of ice huts dotting the frozen landscape. This work looked to acknowledge this ongoing tension while at the same time serving as a reminder that we are all responsible for the health of our shared resources. We live in precarious times of changing climate and destructive pollution of our waterways. And in the end, we are all stewards of these lands. So <clears throat> in 2015, I won a public art commission in Barrie, Ontario. For this piece, I worked with a medical fabricator to create a monument which pays homage to the original inhabitants of the area, namely the Wendat, Nishnabeg, and Haudenosaunee. The call for proposals stated that they were looking for a piece which could act as a landmark. The work is installed on the Nine Mile Portage Trail built by Indigenous people as a trade route. The formal qualities of canoes used to traverse the waterways of the area can be found in the sculptural form. While the eagle feathers adorning the canoes speak to the leaders of the three indigenous nations who called and still call the area home. This began my foray into indigenous placemaking and monument which underpinned my graduate research and artistic outcomes for my master's thesis, which I'm going to present next. So throughout history, my Monuments have been erected to act as reminders of sites, events, and people. In Canada, many of these commemorative markers reflect one side of history and further Indigenous erasure. My 2018 MFA thesis, titled Very Fine People on Both Sides, interrogated the distribution of understanding and multiple perspectives surrounding monuments and reconciliation. It considered the historical, social, and political positioning of monuments and their relationship to Canada's engagement within the process of reconciliation. It investigated how monuments interven monument interventions have been employed by Indigenous artists as a space for reclamation to acknowledge true histories. Through critical discourse analysis and case studies, my thesis investigated how the monument is perceived in contemporary timelines as an underpinning for further research into how the creation and prospect of new monuments proposed under the truth and reconciliation calls to action could be improved to better reflect indigenous and Canadian realities. 
In 2017, Canada celebrated its 150th birthday, which had been interpreted by many as a reminder of existing colonial structures and the continued erasure of Indigenous nations. Across the country, provinces and municipalities planned events and commemorations funded in part by half a billion dollars, earmarked for the occasion by the federal government. As part of the city of Barrie's 150 celebration, the municipality in partnership with local Rotary clubs installed a commemorative subsequent centennial clock on the same shoreline that once stained thousands of Wendat and Anishinaabe peoples. A campaign to partially fund this clock offered the public an opportunity to purchase custom engraved paving stones. Once ordered and engraved, these stones were installed into the parkade surrounding the new monument. I use this occasion to intervene in this site and create a project titled Land by purchasing four of these stones. Two of the stones were ordered in English and two in Anishinaabe Muen and were engraved as follows. This land runs on Anishinaabe time. This land runs on Wendat time. Ni Wam Jiga Deg Aki and Ni Wam Jiga Deg Deboiwen. And you can see those, the stones at the right. Ni Wam Jiga Deg Aki translates to now is the time to see the land. And Ni Wam Jiga Deg Deboiwen means now is the time to see the truth. Through wordplay, the indication of time in each stone references the commemorative clock, both in mechanical function, but also in disruption of the subsequent centennial timeline. Though I hesitate to call the stones installed in land a counter monument, I still refer to this intervention as a partial counter monument based on Natalia Krzynowska's writing, which states, Counter monuments are almost always meaning, multi-meaningful with the multiplicity of their meanings open to the desired polysemy of interpretations of the counter monuments and receivers. The resistance or the prote protest component are further emphasized by the fact that counter monuments aim to bring to the fore and critique what is often forgotten, omitted or silenced by the collectivity especially in relation to its collective history in the official narratives of the past. So taking advantage of the system offered by the city of Barrie and the Rotary Clubs, land incorporates a resistance and or protest component to this Canada 150 monument. The function of the subsequent centennial clock was to celebrate a settler-based timeline. And as Krzyzanowska states, the practice of erecting, unveiling monuments links past and present as well as helps sustaining the social and political status quo. By intervening in this attempt to maintain Barry's status quo, land quietly disrupts the settler narrative through the insertion of indigenous presence. Its intended function is to serve as resistance to indigenous erasure as, and as a permanent land acknowledgement. I'm just going to take a sip of water here. So the gallery installation of Aki builds upon and references the phrase, phrases found in lands and grave stones. Aki, Nishnabe Muen for land, informs the words further through materials and mode of display. The materials that make up this installation are four custom made plinths four custom-made acrylic vitrines and smudge ash ashes. On top of the plinths under clear vitrines rest the phrases from land, carefully stenciled out of the collected ashes. The ashes themselves are a mixture created from three traditional medicines, cedar, sweetgrass, and sage used in smudging ceremony. I opted to use these specific medicines as my knowledge and understanding of their function is that of healing and cleansing. As Nishnabe Kwe, I perceive this as washing away the old and starting anew, just as others may see the process of reconciliation. Nishnabe scholar and writer Leanne Simpson states, we are each responsible for finding our own meanings, for shifting those meanings through time and space, for coming to our own meaningful ways of being in the world. Through creating works such as this, I spend time contemplating how I find meaning and reflect upon my world. 
As I created the words from ashes, I thought about the preciousness of land and language, a language lost to me through my grandfather's residential school experience. The decision to display this work on plinths under the protection of clear vitrines spoke as much to the value of these delicate words in material form as it does to Anishinaabe Muen, one of many indigenous languages endangered through residential school policy and continued settler colonialism. The process of creating a key is delicate and requires time, patience, a steady hand and breath. These slow making procedures are meditative and an essential part of my practice. <clears throat> so central to my interest in the discourse monuments and about monuments and specifically about what to do with offensive colonial monuments were the protests, actions and conversations in the US and Canada dominating my social media feeds for the entire duration of my thesis studies. In particular, Charlottesville, Virginia became the site of a confrontation which began online and manifested itself at the site of the Robert E. Lee Monument on August 12, 2017, involving a group of neo-Nazi and alt-right protesters coming together to, quote, unite the right. This group gathered to protest the proposed removal of the Robert E. Lee Monument in Emancipation Park. A now infamous Tiki Torch rally was held the night prior and directed the attention of social media and mainstream media feeds towards a planned rally and protest scheduled to take place the following day. As a group of alt-right and neo-Nazis marched together carrying Tiki torches, the online reactions of many were of shock. The world watched a group of white nationalists openly and proudly chanting phrases such as one people, one nation, end immigration, and Nazi slogans such as Sieg Heil and blood and soil. The following day brought clashes and protests between groups of people whom the media segregated as the left uh, and the alt-right. These physical clashes eventually dispersed, but not before 32 year old Heather Hare was killed after a car crashed into a group of counter protesters of which she was a part. In response to the events of August 12th and to speak to the violence that manifests at sites of contentious monuments, both in Canada and the US, Anishinaabe artist and activist Raven Davis and I created a collaborative piece titled Emancipation filmed at Emancipation Park. This piece was performed by Davis and filmed and edited by myself. Leading up to the creation of this work, Davis and I strategized and renegotiated this body of work based on my original idea, which was to perform at the Heather Hare site. Raven felt that making work at the memorial site would focus on Hare's death more than the th that of the thousands of other black and indigenous bodies who had lost their lives. Davis's assessment of the site specificity was, of course, correct, something I had mistakenly overlooked. After further discussion, we decided to perform the piece at the site of the Robert E. Lee Monument instead. In this piece, David performs an honor song in front of the monument with the intention to pay tribute to those who've lost their lives in the process of working towards true emancipation. For the exhi exhibition viewing of this work, which you're seeing here, uh, the film of Davis's performances was projected onto the wall in close to life-size proximity. The effect of this large-scale projection allowed the viewer to not only engage with Raven, but also to engage with the Robert E. Lee monument. The presence of Raven's singing heard throughout the gallery complemented the other artworks shown and emphasized the indigenous interventions to monument that underpinned the, uh, my body of thesis work. <clears throat> so um, due to time constraints, I wasn't sure how long we had, so I, I was trying to make sure I, I didn't want to uh, put all of my MFA thesis work in because I, I wasn't sure if everything would start on time and whatnot. So. Um, yeah, I, but I wanted to end this talk by showing you two more recent pieces. Um, this first was created in response to ongoing organizing, protest, and advocacy for Indigenous waters and lands worldwide. 
For the audio component of this piece, I layered five audio clips of indigenous women, women singing at various indigenous protests worldwide. The result is a com complex musical compilation, which reflects the passion and intensity of indigenous worldviews and culture. For the drum, I pulled the visual sound waves produced from each individual protest song and embroidered one, each one over the other into the drum, creating a visual landscape of the multiplicity of voices. Nundam Na invites you to take in the layered voices of five nations gathered in protest and song. From New Zealand to Standing Rock, Brazil to Hawaii, though separated by oceans and thousands of miles, their hearts strum in unison with each other and with the earth. They fight for their rights and in doing so, our collective futures in this time of climate crisis. So I'm gonna try and play, um, whoops, I went back. I'm gonna try and play the audio for you so you get an idea and you can, I'll just leave it on the slide. That gives you kind of kind of an idea as to what was uh, what was going on on that one. So lastly, I'd like to quickly share with you one of uh, several small vignettes that I created shortly after the lockdowns for COVID-19 began. Um, as a new language learner, I've been engaged in learning and understanding how our language is directly connected to their to the land. In this, we have many words used when we speak about land, including snow and ice. In this piece, filmed in the spring of 2020, Nizakami translates to ice breaking up and was filmed in my front yard on Lake Nipissing. <laughs> We'll start again. <laughs> so that concludes my presentation. Um, once again, thank you very much to Sarah and the Texas Women's University for providing me with the opportunity to speak about my practice. Um, you can learn more about my work and see my other vignettes on my website. I'm also very active on Twitter and Instagram since should you wish to follow me. So chi miigwech. All right, I'm back, yay. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, so we have plenty of time for questions and I'm really excited about that. Um, what I'll do is I'll kind of be the moderator. Um, folks who are on Zoom, you're welcome to type it in the chat and I'll read it out loud or you're welcome to unmute yourself. Folks who are in the room, I'd love to hear your questions too. It might be a situation where you need to get closer <laughs> to the mic to ask them. But maybe in order to give you all a minute to 
kind of percolate those questions, I'll start with one. <clears throat> uh, and so, um, Elan, I thought it was such a fabulous moment when you're talking about the, the pedagogical aspect of artwork and how <laughs> in doing that piece that is connected to your grandfather being um, taken away to the residential school, how many of the non-Indigenous folks who were there like didn't know that history. And mm -hmm. I think similar in the US, Americans, um, non-Indigenous Americans don't know about boarding schools. Um, and so, you know, I, I thought that that was something that was really interesting. And then of course, the interdisciplinary um, aspect of your work. And I think that that's something here at TWU we're really interested in, like how can we use multiple media in order to explore a concept or a question? And so my question for you is, is how is this interdisciplinary practice important to you in, in having your work have that pedagogical part? Yeah, great question. Um, so all of my work starts with research, right? Um, so whether it's, it's reading or sometimes uh, like even with, uh, you know, some of, sometimes I'm watching a documentary, um, and I'm like, oh, wow, I just had an idea for something. And then of course it goes into a little bit more research, but, um, I, I deter, I was determined, especially after realizing with that, that one sculpture with aggressive assimilation, um, about the residential schools, I was determined to make sure that I didn't screw up. <laughs> so, so basically I wanted it so that if anybody was to ever come at me to say, Hey, but what about this? I always had my, my eyes dotted and my T's crossed. So <clears throat> that's why um, all of it's really important to me that I conduct just a, a, a large amount of research prior to creating any creating anything because I don't want to run into problems. Um, so I want to make sure that what I'm saying is truthful. So yeah. Thank you. Mm. From our audience. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Christine. I'm also a professor at Texas Um, My question oh, is, how does it uh, come about your um, collaborations with other First Nation peoples? Like, what does that look like? How do you, how do you um, get together and how does this uh, result in like the project uh, that was on the building? Yeah. Um, thank you. I, so interesting. Yeah. So I actually collaborate with, I, I, I collaborate with Raven Davis on a couple of projects. Um, Raven and I are actually pr very good friends. So um, it started out when I, I met Raven when I was out in Halifax doing my BFA. And uh, we just became really, really good friends. And we'd sit around down by the, the Halifax wa waterfront having appetizers and a glass of wine and just you know talking about projects we could do, right? So um, whenever I get a, a project that I think that Raven would be good for, um, you know, they're on the phone. Um, I also collaborate with um, Ryan Rice, uh, Jason Berg, Vanessa Dion Fletcher, and Logan McDonald. Um, what I, I, sh I should have talked a little bit about this, but um, we uh, work on a, a indigenous placemaking project called uh, Land is Where Your Feet Touch the Ground, which is a curatorial project um, uh, from by made by Ryan Rice, who is um, basically our curator. So we actually created like a large scale um, installation at Fort York in Toronto, um, right? I think it was uh, the fall before COVID. So I think it would have been 2019 fall 2019 and um yeah just kind of presidents uh uh I'm, I'm for some reason that word just lost me <laughs> um precedenting uh indigenous placemaking on colonial land right 
so I guess, how do I find them? Um, they just appear in my lives because we all, because to I'll be truthful, the indigenous art world, even worldwide is very small. And the indigenous art world in Canada is even smaller. So a lot of us know, you know, we wind up at the same conferences, we wind up at the same events and, you know, we always wind up going out for karaoke at the end. Right. So <laughs> I hope that answered it. Other questions? I know there's a lot of my students out there on, on Zoom and in person who have excellent yeah. questions. Question asking is always the, the challenging part. I Sometimes I even get stuck for a question. <laughs> All right. And <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, and I'm Tan. So I see that uh, is the, the question is that is material or selection of uh, medium um, important to you when creates um, an artwork and as well as doing the research? Yes, absolutely. So um, I I'm a huge fan of Brian Jungen, and if you've ever if you've never heard of his work, definitely look him up. Um, but uh, for me, um, I use, I specifically use materials that are gonna inform the meaning of my sculpture. Um, so sometimes those materials are traditional, but a lot of times they're not, right? So, um, you know, but I'm, I'm still looking at like the formal qualities and how can I, how can I inform, a, you know, um, a sculpture that looks like, X by using Y materials. Um, so yes, I because I I I feel very strongly about um, using the proper materials to represent what you're trying to talk about. And I actually teach a course um, at OCAD or or was teaching a course at OCAD before lockdown um, called Indigenous Art Experimentation where one project for my students was specifically geared towards, you know, using materials that will inform your sculptural work. So um, yeah, I, it's definitely, it's, it's very important to me. Plus I like, I like using with, you know, uh, there's a lot of artists that use the same materials over and over again. And I like to um, mix it up a little bit. Hello. Since Hi. We're about, um, specific materials. I wanted to ask just as we were looking through your artwork, um, the piece with the embroidered sound waves of the women singing, you chose to specifically keep the iPod to listen to the sounds um, as opposed to, I guess, like hiding it or having some other method. So significance mm -hmm. of the iPod in that piece? Um, yeah, interesting. So uh, honestly, because they have, you know, the, there's those little speakers that you can get that kind of hang down and they do a really good job too. But um, the iPod is actually just a, you know, it's that iPod has one song on it and that's, <laughs> that's it. It's just the, the, the indigenous women singing. So um, it's just one of those things where I, I had an iPod and I, I thought, well, at least it'll, it'll travel well. It can get, it can be easily installed in galleries um, and it allows for, some contemplation when you've got the headphones on as opposed to hearing this over and over and over again in a gallery when you're when you're in a gallery with open music so um yeah I really wanted people to be able to to hear it on their you know through the headphones and and sort of understand the different layers which I'm not sure if it came across you know as as nicely as it well nicely as as good of quality as it does when it comes through the iPod and, and the head headphones that I use for it. So thank you. Mm -hmm. thank you. So um, with the first work you're talking about how that's when you realize, you know, that your work could be very educational to the community. 
Mm -hmm. And then you did your work in North Bay um, residential, like on that lake in Nipsing. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering, I know you're, it's very educational and you're like addressing like the tensions between these communities and them needing to like work together, acknowledge like their part in the environmental destruction. Have mm -hmm. you seen any, like, I know you're drawing attention to that. Has anything like fruitful come of that? Any political conversations or bills or any kind of community efforts to maybe like better these issues at all? Yeah, interesting. Um, so it's it's been an on a, a very long ongoing um, source of contention between our two communities. Um, interestingly enough, so we uh, the government actually made it so that we weren't allowed to fish on our own lake for a long time. And uh, I think that we finally got our rights back. I think it was in the eighties. Um, but even with that, we weren't allowed to do commercial fishing, um, which is kind of cra crazy considering, um, considering the fact that, you know, we've been, we've been here for 10,000 years, right. Fishing this lake. So um, what has come out of it is that, so we, our reserve, um, Nipissing First Nation, we actually have our own hatchery. So we are at contributing to the population of the uh, pickerel within the lake and looking after it in, and have a memor memorandum of understanding um, with the Ministry of Natural Resources. So we share data with the Ontario government about the fishery. Um, it's very sad, actually. There's a lot of racism that comes out of it. Um, you can't, uh, anytime there's an article in the local paper about the, the lake, there's always, you see the comments under there, oh, well, the, the Indians are fishing, fishing out the lake, you know? Um, meanwhile, historically, um, we're actually looking at, so we used to have a very uh, high population of sturgeon, lake sturgeon in our lake. And um, back in the, 30s and 40s, um, there was a commercial caviar um, industry that was up, up the lake from us. And they actually um, almost completely obliterated the, the sturgeon population in the lake using big pound nets. So, um, you know, when, when you're talking about historical inaccuracies, that's what we're talking about, right, is, is that there's there's these myths or just inaccurate information that's been delivered to residents, non-Indigenous residents of the area. And, you know, automatically anything, anything to do with the lake or the population of the pickerel is, is always our fault. So, um, <clears throat> yeah. So for the artwork, I mean, did people, did, I don't think it changed anything, but it, it did talk about it, right? And I, I actually did get a little bit of, um, a little bit of agitated um, North Bay people who, uh, who had a few things to say about it, but um, it didn't bother me. <laughs> yeah. I'll pop back in really quickly. Um, I'm really interested in how you maybe anticipate your art being part of your dissertation work. Mm. Yeah, so interestingly enough, I kind of veered away from like making art or um, working on art as much for my dissertation work. Um, there is a research creation component to my, P <clears throat> to my PhD. But aside from making um, the films, right, the little vignettes that kind of speak to the um, Anishinaabe language, and I probably could have put one more in to give you a little bit more of an idea as to what the series looks like, but um, those were sort of um, just me working through kind of ideas and thoughts about how to approach my dissertation writing, and a lot gave me a little bit of freedom to experiment with um, not only with film, but with using, you know, uh, 
using the film as a tool to um, bring the indigenous Anishinaabe Moen to the public. Um, and also, you know, as a way to sort of think through how our words are connected to the land. And so that comes back into my dissertation, right? So, cause I'm, I'm talking about hidden histories of, of Nipissing. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One last chance for the Zoom folks. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Okay, I just want to give you a round of applause again. This has been really wonderful, and, and thank you so much for sharing your time and knowledge and art with us tonight. Yeah, no problem. Thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate it. The awkward turning. <laughs> But I just, I just wanted to say thank you again. Yes, of course. Thanks, Sarah. I appreciate it a lot. Yeah. Well, have a wonderful night and, and we'll be in touch. You too. Okay. Enjoy your class. Thanks. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> Bye.